Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Rafael Espinal. I am the president and executive director of Freelancers Union. I'm so glad uh, you can join us at this hour. Uh, we're gonna be speaking about the Freelancers and Free Act. As you all know, it's a law uh, that passed in the New York City Council and was signed by the mayor of New York uh, back in the tw around 2015, 2016, uh, if, if I remember correctly. But it was really a monumental law uh, and uh, really continues to be, uh, I think, the where the city continues to be the leader uh, around protecting protections, creating protections for freelancers. Uh, we are continuing to be, well, I think now Minnesota actually passed a similar law to the Freelancers of Free Act, but we are one now, if not only the few cities that actually have this protection to ensure that at the end of the day, you are able to get paid. You know, one of the biggest issues and concerns we have from our members uh, is usually client related. And, uh, and when it comes down to it, a lot of our members uh, do have issues with non-payment. Uh, and but because of this law in New York, uh, they have been able to get uh, you know the, the resources and services they need to collect that payment. Now we at the union as well have been doing a lot of work uh, to increase uh, our ability to give you live and you know on the on demand support. Uh, we created an advocacy uh, space. If you email us at advocacy, at freelancersunion.org with the question, with the concern, you know, someone from our team will be able to get back to you and point you in the right direction. Uh, and if you're having any other client issues that are not related to the Freelancers Free Act, you can always go on our webpage at freelancersunion.org uh, under client issues, uh, where you'll find, you know, guides on how to deal with issues with clients, but you'll also find a client complaint form that you can use uh, to provide us with the information uh, on the issues you're facing and we can get back to you and how we can help. So we encourage you to go on that page. We've been doing a lot of work to ensure uh, that you have the support you need across the board. Uh, but today we are actually joined uh, by the commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections in the city of New York. Uh, commissioner Salas has been doing a lot of great work in not only implementing the Finance and Free Act, but they're in charge of being the agency that enforces it and is there to support you and guide you through, through any of the issues you're having uh, with non-payment. So uh, with that said, I'd like to uh, call her up to join us. Uh, we do have a few questions for her. So Commissioner, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, you've been well through this pandemic. I know it's been tough for a lot of us, but it's been great to hear about all the great work you've been doing. Not, you know, as the agency as a whole, but specifically with the Freelancers of Free Act, because one of the biggest concerns we've heard uh, at the height of the pandemic was that a lot of freelancers weren't getting paid for work they, they, that they've completed uh, prior to the shutdowns, uh, and then they were also weren't getting paid for work that they were completing during the shutdowns. Uh, so your, your work has been extremely valuable to our members, to the union. We thank you on behalf of all our members for all of your work. Thank you so much, Rafael. Thank you for having me today. It's really always a pleasure to, to talk to you about uh, what my agency is seeing and how we can actually do better for freelancers in New York City. Um, and I just want to say a few things about the agency um, because I know that freelancers are also consumers. They're often also workers employed with companies at the same time that they're freelancing. And at my agency, uh, we have, uh, um, you know, the, the authority to enforce the laws that protect consumers and workers in New York City. And we also have resources um, that can help New Yorkers improve their financial health. So I want you to know for all of those issues, even though today we're going to focus on, on freelancers rights and uh, the protections for in this industry. Uh, you should know that you can come to us with questions, uh, with concerns, or to file complaints if you feel like you're being aggrieved by um, any business that you're dealing with uh, with respect to your payment, but also um, with respect to your rights as a consumer. Um, and you're right, Rafael, that um, you know the pandemic obviously has caused a huge, huge, huge financial distress in our communities in New York City, and freelancers were heavily impacted. We did get... Uh, uh, a lot of phone calls from freelancers who, uh, whose companies refused to pay them uh, during the pandemic, claiming that they just couldn't afford to, to make those payments. Um, our office continued to, to work even though we moved to our services remotely in March. We were able to accommodate our staff with um, 
computers and telephone, uh, cell phones so that they could uh, continue to mediate these complaints from freelancers. It is um, a, a groundbreaking law. Uh, you've heard me say this before that I actually think this is one of my most favorite laws because I think it has the right incentives built in into the law to really um, persuade companies that they must be complying with this, uh, with this, with the payment, right, for freelancers. Um, a couple of things about the work to date. The law has been in place since May 2017, and we have received since then uh, close to 1,500 complaints. And in addition to that, we've received over 800 um, calls with just with questions from both freelancers and hiring companies. To date, we've rec helped recover uh, close to $1.5 million uh, for freelancers who were not paid on time. Now, I know, uh, you know we're proud of this work, but we know, I know that we could be doing more. Um, and we certainly don't want any freelancers in New York City to go without their due payment. Um, most recently, one of our cases, our largest recoveries has been for a freelance worker employed by Revlon. Um, and the freelancer was owed $55,000 and received that money due to our efforts to, to resolve the complaint. Um, we have about 200 open matters right now. Um, and I was sharing with um, Rafael before, before we started this um, uh, meeting that, um, you know, that obviously the pandemic uh, has been uh, hard on everyone. And we have also had some significant budget cuts in, in city government. And so, um, you know, we, we're very thinly staffed. Uh, and, the, and that is the, you know, that's the truth. We're thinly staffed. We're trying to get to all of our cases, but you will see some delays. Um, I'm sure you've already seen that. Um, but hopefully in the next uh, few months, uh, I know that we have today some good news from the federal government. So we're really hopeful that we'll be able to fill uh, some vacancies that we have uh, currently. Um, and, you know, just generally, I would just say, uh, you know, freelance workers, um, the a majority of the cases that come to us are from freelance workers in the film, video, graphic and web design uh, industries home contractors and repair, uh, translation and media, some of the industries that are um, uh, represented the most in, in our work. Um, and, and yes, it's true that now Minnesota has a law protecting freelancers, but we continue to be one of the few uh, municipalities in the entire world that actually has been able to push for these protections. And I know that we can do more, and I know that both Rafael and the Freelancers Union will be um, uh, leading this work. So thank you so much. I am here to just answer your questions. I know that you have a number of questions and I'm sure the audience will have some too. Yeah, well, well thank you for that, Commissioner. It's really, really outstanding to hear uh, the amount of uh, money you're able to get back to freelancers, $1.5 million. Uh, I think it's extraordinary to hear. Uh, one, of course, that that there are so many freelancers that have had that continue to see this have this issue, but the fact that your agency was able to help, uh, you know, get get them paid, you know, I'm sure has been able to improve the lives of many of our members. So thank you for your work on on that. Um, so uh, one of the we have a few questions here. I guess one of them is, you know, can you walk us through the process of what it's like uh, to follow to follow a complaint uh, with with DCA. Uh, to this day, we still have members who are learning about the law for the first time. Uh, one of their first questions is, you know, how do I go about making a complaint? Yes. Um, so there are a number of ways. Uh, I will always say the easiest way, if you if there's only one thing you remember is remember three one one, right? That is an easy number to remember. Uh, when you call 311, all you need to say is, I'm a freelance worker, I have a question or I have a complaint, and they're going to transfer you to my office uh, where we have, again, we have intake people, we have uh, our core navigator, um, and we have other staff who will be making sure that your complaint or your questions get addressed. We also, you can also visit us on our website and file a complaint online at, um, I'm trying to see if I have the email address too, but um, it's nyc.gov slash dcwp. But I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, Michelle, to 
post some of the links on YouTube. I believe she's doing that right now. Mm -hmm. um, and she may be able to like post the email address, which right now I can't remember. Um, so, uh, so those are easy ways to reach out to us and to file your complaints or give us a call. Now, um, you know, what, what the law has done, right? What the law uh, requires of uh, hiring companies right now is that they put those, the contracts uh, that are valued at $800 or more in writing. Um, that is one of the biggest issues that freelancers had in terms of being able to get paid under their contracts. And oftentimes the terms were not uh, written down. And so, it, you know, it was always a, a dispute between the freelancer and the hiring company as to what actually was agreed on. So the law requires that contracts must be in writing. If they're not in writing, um, the hiring company can be subject to penalties. And we've had some success um, often uh, when freelancers have called us and said, well, I can't get the company to give me a contract in writing. Uh, you know, and we've been able to contact those hiring companies and remind them of their obligations. But we also have uh, templates in addition to the materials that Freelancers Union makes available to freelancers. We do have template uh, form contracts that you can simply download from the website, our website, um, and use that uh, to go to the hiring company and say, I need you to do this. Uh, I need you to fill this out um, if you want me to work with you. Um, and, you know, the, the law also requires, I mean, I mean, the biggest thing for freelancers was always that they were not getting paid on time, right? Many freelancers uh, uh, told us that um, they actually had to end up going to court in order to just make sure that they got paid for the services that had already um, performed. And so the law makes it so that uh, freelancers must be paid on time. And if the contract is silent on when the date is for payment, um, freelancers, um, the, law, the law basically defaults to 30 days after the freelancer completed the work under the contract. There are important protections um, against retaliation. Um, you know, another complaint for freelancers was that if I file a complaint or if I demand the money I'm owed, you know, I'm blacklisted, right? Uh, we've been able to address uh, retaliation complaints too. We take retaliation very, very seriously um, and we fast track those complaints to make sure that the companies understand that not only will they be liable for, you know, the money they owe uh, freelancers, they can be subject to damages, but they also can be fined if they retaliate against the freelancers. So those are very, very important protections. Um, and um, again, if you know, you don't have to remember all of this. You just need to know that you have rights and that you can call us if you have questions or to file a right. complaint. Got it. Um, so the, yeah, that's that's really that's really helpful, Commissioner. Thank you, thank you for all of that. So just very simply, if you have a complaint, call three one one. Three one one will connect you to someone at your agency, and uh, someone at your agency will be able to help that freelancer. And if not, they can go on the website. Uh, and be able to file a complaint through there. And then you also have a, t a contract template, correct? We do. I, and I found the email address. So mm -hmm. it's freelancer at dca.nyc.gov. Um, okay. So it's very simple, freelancer at dca.nyc.gov. It goes directly to my, um, my office, to my staff, mm -hmm. right? So if you email us there, you don't even have to call 311. We get that, we can like uh, communicate with you and then give you a call if we need clarification. Got it. So one one a question I actually received recently and you and you touched on it was, was the question of retaliation, right? So, you know, members will call, they want to use the law, they need the help, but they're afraid that they'll be blacklisted, that this client wouldn't want to hire them again in the future, or this client will let other other folks know that they should that they shouldn't trust you. So what, what is what is that process like? How do you receive protection under that? So the law makes it clear that you are that um, retaliating against a freelance worker for filing a complaint, for demanding, a, you know, a contract in writing. Those are all actions that, uh, you know, retaliatory acts that uh, can result in penalties. Right. Um, and so we do urge free freelancers that the moment that they get some pushback from the company or they feel that, you know, they were negotiating a contract, everything would seem fine, or the moment they ask for things to be in writing um, to and, 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 and the company backs off, just call us because 
Um, it is a little trickier, right? When you are a freelancer, it's a little different from when you are an employee that works only for an employer. Sometimes it's easier in those cases to detect the retaliation, right? Uh, but a company that simply says, I am not going to work with you um, because you're demanding too many things uh, can be liable for retaliation under this law. Um, there are penalties. I don't think I have that exact amount here, but I do think it's about $2,500 mm -hmm. uh, uh, that the company can be fined uh, if we find that they retaliate against you. Again, uh, you know, we understand. I mean, workers are, and workers, freelance workers, you know, obviously everyone needs a job, right? We all want to work. Uh, and it, the pandemic has put, um, a lot more pressure on workers to to basically accept sometimes conditions that maybe they wouldn't have in the past right mm -hmm. i but we do want you to know that for us um it is very important and we take it very seriously if a company or an employer is uh a, you know trying to intimidate you into not filing a complaint or not asking for your rights um we do also um you know we need to remind um um workers and freelance workers as well that um immigration status is irrelevant right so if you have uh, working papers here or you don't the moment you've done the work right the moment that you are entering into a contract for instance with a hiring company you have all the rights uh, um your all the protections under our law regardless of your immigration status um so it is, you know, it's important again that you call us and you talk to us, even if you don't know clearly, is this really retaliation or not? Let us analyze the situation. We will decide, we will tell you if we think there's been a violation of the law in your case. Great, well, thank you for that info, Commissioner. So how long does the process usually take uh, after you make that initial call? You know, by the time they call, they've probably been waiting for two or three months uh, for their payment. Uh, so so what is the what is the turnaround time? So basically, typically what it, what happens is after we get a complaint, right, my office will notify the company, the hiring party, that there's been a complaint filed against them. Now, the hiring company has up to 20 days to respond uh, to this complaint, right, from our office. Mm -hmm. um, after they respond, we have to send um, um, this response to the complaint and the freelancer who filed the complaint with us. If the hiring party does not respond to our notice of complaint within the 20 days that the law says, now we can give uh, the freelance workers um, basically what is supposed to be like a rebuttable presumption or, you know, a, a, a letter that says uh, the hiring party re did not respond, right, within the 20 days. Mm -hmm. And freelance workers can use that when they go to court. Um, and the court is supposed to give... Um, the freelancers a presumption in their favor, right? That if there was no response, then there was probably likely not compliance with this law, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so, you know, don't delay, obviously, in filing your complaint. The sooner you come to us, the sooner we can get uh, your issue resolved. Um, but, you know, we don't, um, one thing that I would say, I mean, we ourselves at DCWP, we're not a court, right? We are an agency in this particular case. We don't make determinations if, you know, let's say that the hiring company says, well, here's my proof that I paid this and I didn't pay that, but I paid this other thing, or the freelancer failed to do this piece of the project, right? Uh, we cannot get into this back and forth because we're not a court. Uh, so in that case, you will end up going to, to court yourself, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The law does provide for attorney's fees so that you don't have to pay that from your pocket, but the hiring company would have to pay for that. Um, but uh, the majority of our cases actually do get resolved uh, after we notify the hiring company that there's been a complaint filed. So, you know, we'll do our best to try to get your case resolved without you having to go to court. Got it. So uh, after making the first complaint, you send a, a, a kind of a warning letter to the client that they should pay on time because this is the law. Is that is that accompanied with a with a with a fine or is just an initial letter? The initial letter simply simply says we have a complaint against you for failure to comply with a 
you know, mm-hmm. freelancers and free act, timely payment, or you did not provide a contract in writing to this individual, right? And then um, at that point, the company could, within those 20 days, respond and say, here's a copy of the check, they cashed it. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it could happen that someone else cashed the check, right? And then in, at that point, it becomes a dispute and maybe there was right. some fraud there. But so they have the 20 days to respond, right? And um, again, if they come back and they argue, well, they did, the freelancer did not complete the work, then it becomes a little more complicated, right? Uh, but like I said, oftentimes when the company is simply delaying the payment, right? Just when they get a notice from us, from a city government agency, they suddenly decide, oh, I don't want to play any more games. Let me just go ahead and do this because I was going to pay, I was going to pay late, but Mm -hmm. okay, let me just do this, right? So, yeah, so it's not like we issue a fine immediately um, because in reality, we we would issue fines for a couple of things, right? Uh, We would issue fines if the company fails to put the contract in writing, for instance. Mm -hmm. We would issue fines if we find that there was retaliation, right, or blacklisting, right? But then if it becomes an issue of like he said, she said, you know, both parties are saying that the other one did not comply with the terms of the contract, that is an issue for the court to resolve. Um, Got it. Yeah. And that leads into my next question. Um, uh, a lot of uh, freelancers uh, would, would uh, mention to us that when they when they do end up going to court, um, there's a lot of confusion on the on the judge's part on whether or not you know about the law and whether the law actually applies to a certain case. Well, what what can a freelancer do in that situation? How can they help? What is the best approach they can take to to educate the judge on this on this very unique law that only exists in the city of New York? So look, we do have you know we're not obviously we cannot provide legal representation mm-hmm. right to freelancers. Um, so we cannot give like legal opinions or interpretations. We do have a, a number of materials on our website that you know basically are, you know, have some weight because they are uh, published uh, by the agency, by our agency in our role as an administrative agency, right? That enforces mm-hmm. the law. So there should be some deference to that by the court. But it is true what you point out, Rafael, especially with newer laws like this one. Oftentimes, judges are not that familiar with, you know, what is this? I've never seen this before, and I'm not sure what to do here, right? Mm -hmm. So you could refer judges to our website. You could print some of the materials and bring it to them. But this question, for me, raises maybe uh, sort of the possibility of what else could we do, right, to educate um, whether small claims court judges or Supreme Court judges, and it might be something interesting to explore with you and the freelancers union about holding like, you know, either a CLE or holding some kind of meeting where, you know, you invite judges to learn about this law, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so at least when when someone comes in, a freelancer comes in, it's not the first time they see it or read it, right? right. Um, so it, it's something to think about. Um, it's been, you know, it's not that different from like, let's say workers who were not paid, uh, who actually are employees, right? Traditional employees of an employer, mm-hmm. sometimes they go to small claims court and the judge says, well, I've never had to look at the labor law. I don't know what mm-hmm. this means, right? And I know there have been efforts before to kind of educate the judges a little bit on like, these are the top things to keep in mind with respect to these particular statutes of law, right? So. Um, you know, it is a good question. I think I'd be interested in looking into whether we can collaborate on something like that. Yeah. Right. So super let's, important. Yeah. Especially in the city, and and I've seen, and I've seen the the guidance and the rules that you have on your website, which is which is super helpful for anyone who wants to understand like the the details of the law as well. Uh, so it does exist, and I, I guess I encourage you know our members to print that form out. You know, in the meantime, take it take it to your case, take it show it to your judge, give it to your lawyer. Uh, and I'm sure that would help you uh, clarify some of the issues there. Uh, is, is there a time limit uh, that someone can file a complaint with the agency? Is there like a yeah, like a statute a limitation? Yes. yes, absolutely. It's two years. I want mm-hmm. to make sure I'm, I'm double checking on that, but it is. Uh, I believe it's two years. Um, um, yes, from the moment like um, that you realize your your rights were violated, right? Got um, it. And the law has only been in place since 2017, right? So mm-hmm. uh, we did do a lot of um, 
outreach at the time. I know the Freelancers Union did a lot of work to make sure that freelancers understood that this this was a new right. Uh, but it's always good reminding people. I know that a lot of uh, people who probably lost their jobs also have tried to engage in freelance work during the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? So people who may not be aware of their rights. So two years. Got it. Um, what are any other additional resources that the DCWP, your agency, has to assist freelancers or or just ge the general public that you think are, are helpful for anyone going through this pandemic or just in general? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, and you know this, Rafael, from the time that you were in the council that we have an Office of Financial Empowerment mm -hmm. and uh, obviously also with a consumer protection angle, we've tried to do a number of things um, since the pandemic to provide some relief to our New Yorkers. Uh, so a couple of things we did um, with, um, we licensed debt collectors in New York City, right? So all agencies collecting debt in, in New York City, whether they agencies are companies from abroad or from other states, but they're collecting in New York City, they have to have a license from my office. And mm -hmm. what we did is we put together a template letter um, that New Yorkers could use uh, print out and and fill in with the com name of the company that was calling them, right? We got basically calls from people saying, this collection agencies are calling me. I can't pay this debt. I'm out of work or I didn't get paid myself. I can't pay this. And it was causing a lot of stress to New Yorkers. So this template, basic, the letter basically says it's written and addressed to the, the debt collection agencies. And it says, um, there's a rule that allows us uh, to basically enforce the consumer's right to not have communications uh, mm -hmm. from these agencies, especially during the pandemic. So basically, if you are having an issue, right, we still, we're still, we, we are not out of the pandemic yet, right? During the state of emergency, you're having issues with debt collection agencies, you can print this letter from our website, right? You can just fill it out. And at that point, if the company continues to call you and text you or email you um, or send you letters, they will be in violation of our rule and we could assess a fine. So the companies know this and they'll stop immediately if you send this letter. But the, uh, the federal law requires that the letter has to be in writing. That's why we put together the templates so that people could easily just use it for and, and individualized, personalized, depending on their situation, right? Um, our Office of Financial Empowerment, our, we have financial counseling, and we also have the free tax preparation services. We're in the middle of the tax season, so that is super important for freelancers to know that um, they can do their taxes depending on their income levels, right? For last year, any household who earned $68,000 or less in 2020, um, you're able to use our services for free. Um, and um, if it's an individual, a single person, uh, if you earn 48,000 or less in 2020, you can also file your taxes for free with certified, IRS certified trade uh, volunteer preparers who are located across the city. Um, we have services both uh, in person, virtual, uh, preparation mm -hmm. services, we have them uh, where you can drop off your materials and then come back and get the return when it's prepared. Uh, so make sure that you look into that because um, especially now with all of the stimulus payments, right? Um, individuals who were not under the radar of the federal government sometimes missed out on payments, uh, checks that were could have been sent to them. So we want New Yorkers to make sure that they file as soon as they can um, also, because for some freelancers or, or for some um, W-2 employees who maybe did not get a check um, in the last stimulus check, they may be able to now claim it as part of filing their taxes. Uh, so make an appointment. Our financial counselors are an amazing resource uh, for New Yorkers. Typically, what they do is they work with in, uh, New Yorkers um, in like tackling their debt, uh, building assets, you know, um, making sure that they have access to or they are aware of all the potential benefits and emergency relief that we've seen since uh, March last year. Um, the only requisite for these services, again, these are at no cost to New Yorkers, right? Mm -hmm. The only requisite is that you have to be 18 years of age. 
and live or work in New York City, right? If you meet those parameters, you can use uh, um, the services of a financial counselor. Um, we really encourage New Yorkers to use these services because, as you know, uh, um, Rafael, from having been the head of the consumer um, and licensing um, committee in the council, um, oftentimes when there are crises like this, we also see some predatory actors who surface, right, and try to take advantage of that. So if you get communications about student loans consolidation, right, anything like that, or, you know, oh, there's a new relief on the, on the federal government and we can help you out and you just have to pay this much money, like no one should have to pay anything for any kind of government benefit, right? And if you go to a financial counselor, they'll be able to tell you, this is legit, this is, this is the right place to go to, this year they're gonna charge you money, you decide, but at least you're aware of what is the real like government agency, like uh, contact information and who is the private actor who's trying to make money out of the service, right? So our financial counselors, again, you can reach them by calling 311. If you go on our website, you also will see a map of the different like financial counseling centers in the city. Uh, these are all super important resources for all New Yorkers and we do encourage you to call us, to make an appointment with our financial counselors and to prepare your taxes for free uh, with our net network of providers. Um, I think those are most of the, like most, I think, relevant updates for freelancers. Got it. Well, that, that was helpful, Commissioner. I really appreciate it. There, there's some, uh, one or two questions that actually came from our membership. I, I'll probably answer some of them as well. They're very, very straightforward. Um, so one is, what do you see as barriers to giving more teeth to the Freelancers and Free Act? Um, and as you and I both know, Commissioner, your agency only has the power to enforce the law as, as, as it is written. Uh, so uh, I encourage anyone who wants to see the law expanded or get more teeth uh, to organize your local city council member um, and, come and, uh, and inform us on, on how it can be strengthened uh, to support you and it will take a legislative action within the city council uh, to, to change the laws so that the agency and the commissioner can can have the resources they need uh, to uh, enforce those to enforce the law. I will add one, one clarification um, uh, to what I said before. So I, I think I mentioned um, contracts that are worth eight hundred dollars or more must be in writing, but it also includes. Um, in other words, you could have several contracts with the same party, the same company that amount to $800 yeah. in 120 day period, right? In four months that all of those contracts, even though they're each one for less than $800 have to be in writing because in total, they are more than $800. Um, is so that that's four, four months. Right. So it's you're getting $800 a month. Well, so so basically, it's eight hundred dollars or more it has to be in writing. But let's say that you work for the same hiring company over four months, right? Mm -hmm. And each month you only, um, I don't know, two hundred two hundred dollars each month, right? Yeah, it's, maybe that's what you said. I couldn't hear yeah. you well. Yeah. So if that's the case, then that particular situation also co is covered, and your contracts have to be in writing, all of them. Got it. So what if what if I so you would need $800 not paid, or if I have done up to, let's say, $600 worth of work, got paid for $600, and then there's an extra $200 that I have not gotten paid for, can I enforce it then? Right, yes, oh. because um, because it's total, you know, it's really yeah. looking at your relationship with that particular company, right? Yeah. If you're doing $800 or more of, of work for them, then you need to have this in writing, you can call us, you can file a complaint with us. Very valuable information. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, let's try to find another question. Uh, is there any uh, effort uh, on the agency's part or just a city that would connect freelancers with lawyers? Um, you know, let's say they go through your process and it, it is determined that they have to go to, to court. Is there any efforts on the agency's behalf or the city's behalf that will connect that freelancer to uh, 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 an attorney? 
So I believe that our navigator would have some of the resources available. Um, but I think it may be a lot of the same resources that you probably are already referring people to, right? Like some of the legal services organizations. We cannot, as an agency, refer anyone to a private attorney because we're not allowed to endorse any particular individual. So we would be referring people to, oh, you can go to the New York City Bar Association and here's like a, a roster of people, right, that they have or the uh, legal aid or certain nonprofits that will be willing to take these cases. Got it. Uh, I, would, I wanted to just say like, um, you know, it is good practice to try to put your contracts in writing always, right? So don't be discouraged, even if you say like, oh, this seems like it's only going to be $300 and so I'm not covered by the law. It's always good for you to document, right? So even if you can keep things in the email and save them and print them and make sure you're documenting everything, that's still going to help you. Because even if you don't come to our office for help, you can use those documents to go to court and to say it is, I mean, the terms are in writing. I have them on these emails. They don't have to be in a particular form. They just have to be in writing for you to be able to, you know, prove your case. Right. Got it. Yeah, we, we encourage everyone uh, to always have a contract with your client, no matter the, the amounts that you're going to get paid. It's important to have that in writing for the reasons you mentioned, uh, especially if, if you happen to work for this person or this client for more than a month. Uh, and you hit that 800 threshold, you know, the law will be there to protect you if there are any issues down the line. Um, uh, because the, the last question, this is the final question is, is it legal to make, to, is it legal to make a freelancer work on a project after they go over the contract timeline? Right. I, I, any thoughts on your end there? If, if um, we're for a month and uh, the work goes on for two months, is it legal to require the freelancer to work for two months to get paid? So once, so basically, once you the there's a contract, right? Once you have the terms in writing, um, let me put it this way: the the, the company owes you for that work, uh, mm -hmm. and you completed it, right? I I don't I will have to think about whether. You know, the contract terms talk about like a month or two months term. You know, oftentimes it would just be like upon completing a particular project, that's when you get paid, right? Um, the company cannot demand that you do more work, right, for the same amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. So so basically, you know, the, the, what should happen is that you get paid for what you already did. And if you still, they still require your services, then they should enter into another contract for the new additional month, right? That's right. what should happen. Exactly. Great. Well, well thank you that for that, Commissioner. I think that, that wraps up the, uh, the, the conversation, but it was extremely insightful and extremely helpful to know how the agency you know, goes about enforcing the law and the work you're doing and the, su the successes you've had uh, doing that. So we, we encourage anyone and everyone uh, who is having issues with a client uh, you know, if, if, if it's, uh, if it's, if it's a non-payment issue, you know, call 311, get in touch with the agency. Uh, if there are other issues you think the union can help guide you through uh, a process with the client, feel free to reach out to us. We're here to help you. Uh, and our services are free. Uh, you won't have to pay anyone. Uh, so please, uh, you know, get in touch with the commissioner, get in touch with uh, the union and myself, and we're here to help you. Uh, so commissioner, thank you again for joining us. It really was a pleasure seeing you. And thank you for uh, continuing the good fight. Always great seeing you and uh, keep up with the great work uh, and good luck with every, to everyone. Uh, please stay safe and healthy and hopefully we'll be back soon and very, very strong. Definitely. Thank you, Commissioner. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.